friends, at this time we are going to begin the funeral services for Harold Katz. If you have a cell phone or a pager, we would ask for you to please take a moment to turn it off or place it in the silent mode. And officiating today's services will be Rabbi David Flinkenstein from the Chabad of Wilmette. I'd like to first begin with Tehillim. Going to recite Psalm 23, first in Hebrew, and then please join me together in English. Mizmer le David, Adinoi, Roy le Yechsar, Benoiz Desha Yarbitseni, Alme Menucha Sinahaleni, Nafshi Yeshevi Yanacheni, Memagle Tzedek le Manshemoi, Gam ki eilech begeit samoves lo irero ki ato imodi. Shivtecho mishantecho heimo inachamuni. Tarech le fonai shulchon, neged soreroi de shanto vashemen reishi koisirevoya. Ach toivo chesed di difuni koyim echayoi, vishavti, vivesa de noil erech yomim. Please join me together in English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So many friends, family, members are gathered here today to pay tribute to Reb Tzvi, Ben Yaakov, Hakoyen, Vileya, to Harold Katz. Let us remember the words of the wisest of all men, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, encapsulates the entire period, all observances of mourning, in just four simple words. He writes in Ecclesiastes, Vachai yitain el libo, and the living shall take to heart. A funeral is never an event that is scheduled, It's an event which becomes a priority. We put everything on hold. We put our lives on pause. It's a time for reflection. It's a sober time. It's a time when we appreciate the value, the sanctity, the significance, and frailty of life in general and more specifically today, to pay tribute and to learn and be inspired by the life of Harold Katz. Modern physics has taught us that nothing disappears. Matter is just another form of energy and vice versa. If that applies to the physical, how much more so when we're talking about life itself, when we're talking about the neshama, we're talking about the soul. At a funeral, we pay tribute and we also give comfort. 
comfort to the family. The word in Hebrew is nechama. And this becomes the mitzvah throughout the shiva. However, it begins with a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift begins now. It begins with understanding that there's a monumental difference between what this is referred to in English and how it's referred to in Hebrew. In English, this is a funeral. In Hebrew, it's a levaya. The two can be translated the same way, but the truth is they are diametrically opposed. The etymological root of the word funeral is from the old French, la fin. It's the end. It's the final event. It's the last hurrah. Levaya in Hebrew means to escort, implying that there is a continuum. We are escorting. In essence, we're not just escorting the body. We're escorting the neshama. The essence of life continues. The neshama of Reb Tzvi, Reb Yaakov Akoyin, is very much alive. But the paradigm shift begins where our relationship changes. Where Harold Katz once lived amongst us, now he will have to live within us. This is the deeper meaning of what King Solomon writes, Vehachai yiten elibo, and the living shall take to heart. It is customary at a funeral, at a levaya, that we ask mechila. We ask for forgiveness. If in any way we wronged Harold in his lifetime, we did not give the proper respect, the proper COVID of such an individual, we ask for mechila. And beginning asking for mechila, forgiveness, there's just no way, there aren't enough words in the vocabulary to capture your life. And so much of what you do, so much of what you did, no one even knows. And so we ask for forgiveness, we ask for mechila. As we share words about Harold Katz, I'd like to call upon certain individuals to share Eulogies, joining us from Israel, electronically, Rabbi Ethan Katz, his grandson, and then followed by Rabbi Eitan Allen, Rabbi in Park Plaza, and then Adam Butbol, grandson, Jessica and Aaron Katz, grandchildren, followed by Jack Katz. Thank you so much, Rabbi Flinkenstein. It's a difficult thing to be so far geographically, but uh, emotionally, to be right there with you, with everyone. And uh, last night, I was sitting by the Kotel by the Western Wall, and I was thinking of what to say. What could I possibly say about a man who is so beloved by his family, someone so beloved by his community and admired by just about everyone who ever met him, someone who was such a pillar of support to all those who knew him. And as I sat there and I stared at the ancient stones of the Kotel, I was thinking back through cherished memories of Zaidi. I thought about the stability and the solidity of what the stones represented of the Kotel and how that they had stood witness to thousands of years of horrific persecution and bloodshed, and yet miraculously, how divine providence kept these stones standing is a testament to Jewish courage and continuity. And it dawned on me 
that these were the very same attributes and the very same storyline that I so deeply admired and loved about Zaidi. Despite having been witness to horrendous persecution and suffering simply because he was Jewish, somehow miraculously Zaidi emerged from the ashes of the Holocaust and became a stone pillar of support and stability to his family and to all those around him. When I think about what it was to have a grandfather like Zaidi, for myself and for my children to have experienced that, I think about how much of a bracha, how much of a blessing it was to have all those beautiful times that we've spent together. And in truth, I think about what exactly Zaidi's courage and profound inner strength means for the entire Jewish people. As he came to the shores of America with barely anything in his pocket, after having lived through unthinkable horrors in war-torn Europe, Zaidi did what he did best. He built. He built a family. He built a business. He built a home for himself. He even started a construction company so that he could build some more. And he never let a single thing stand in the way, in the way of his goals and his determination to build. I'm so proud to be able to say that the care and the kindness that I affectionately recall when I think of my Zaidi draws me to remind, draws to remind me how much of a hero and a role model that he was to me in so many ways. I truly respected Zaidi's quiet demeanor, which expressed his keen observation of the world, his bright mind. And although Zaidi wasn't always the most talkative, he was constantly scanning the world around him, always looking for different ways that he could mend something, he could fix, he could contribute. And anyone could tell you just by looking into Zaidi's caring eyes that all you needed was just to see, to get a glimpse of the true depth of how much he loved and cared for everyone around him. Zaidi's relentless work ethic combined with his desire to give to others, helped him to create a family with such strong values where caring and giving to one another became second nature. I have very positive and cherished memories of Zaidi from my childhood that I hold very dear to me. But if I may, I'd like to share a more recent one. When my wife and I would come to visit from Israel to see Zaidi pull up and how excited the children were to see Zaidi is he would arrive with mountains of stuffed animals and toys that he so caringly, he went to the store and handpicked each one, what he thought each individual child would like. And how much nachas that that brought him. Occasionally, I would even have to secretly hide away all these stuffed toys and animals in my parents' basement because otherwise we would have had to bring a, an extra eight suitcases back to Israel full of Zaidi's gifts. Please don't tell my kids that. But when I think of Zaidi's determination to rebuild his life from the ashes of Jewish life in Europe, I think we find a secret of Zaidi's survival, which was giving. Zaidi gave more than anyone that I know, and he had one of the biggest hearts, and everyone felt like they had a place in it. After so many years of having everything taken from him, his childhood was stripped away from him, his parents were taken away from him. His siblings were taken away from him. His school education, even his bar mitzvah was taken away from him. Zaidi's defiant roar in response to the persecution was to build a family based upon the secret ingredient of giving and caring. And sure enough, with Zaidi's work ethic, he restored each of those things slowly but surely, including even having his own bar mitzvah aliyah where he read from the Sefer Torah that he dedicated to Chabad of Ulmet. He gave everything to his wife, to his children, to his grandchildren, and to his great-grandchildren. And it's with great pride that I can proudly say that I've been a grateful recipient of Zaidi's warmth and support and his endless love, as all of his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren can attest to. A few months ago, I was speaking with Zaidi on the phone, and I was asking him some questions about his experiences during the war. And I asked him what was the biggest lesson that he had taken away from all the harrowing experiences of the Holocaust. His response was pure Zaidi. His takeaway was that the opportunities and the education that had been stolen from him and his siblings when they were so young was precisely the thing that he wanted to make sure that he secured for his children and his future descendants. And secure it, he did. Last week, I had the privilege of being on a Zoom call as Rabbi Flinkenstein visited Zaidi, and he brought along the Sefer Torah. And I can only imagine what it was like to be there in person 
as I was on Zoom, but to feel the overwhelming emotion that was present in the room. As Zaidi gently lay his hand on the Torah, or Rabbi Flinkenstein and his son, and his son, excuse me, sang so beautifully for him. It was an extremely moving and beautiful moment. And to me, this moment represented a dignified lifetime of accomplishment, where Zaidi constantly was striving to give everything he could to his family and community without any limits. I so deeply respect and celebrate my grandfather's beautiful life. I owe my education and my pride in my Jewish identity and so much more to Zaidi. Zaidi will miss you forever. May the Neshama have a wheel and may we all experience the coming of Mashiach. As you've already heard today, it is difficult, if not impossible, to try to encapsulate our dear Harold Katz, Tzvi Ben Rav Yaakov, as I would call him Yiddish, Hirsch Mechel, and this wonderful, loving, courageous giant of a man. For those who knew him, it was easy to see so many of his wonderful attributes. A person who was kind in a tremendous way, caring and worried about other people, looked for what he could do for other people. A man of tremendous, tremendous generosity, even when it was not expected. How many times just personally he would go to the store and go to one of the price clubs and buy things in bulk, and he would say, well, I saw some nice fruit, Rabbi, so I got you a box of oranges, or I got you, uh, you know, three packages of grapes, because they were at a good price. And, you know, for those who had the privilege of being close to them, he was not just the Zaidi to... Uh, the grandchildren, as we just heard, and the great-grandchildren, but he was, he was happy to be anyone Zaidi who he could connect with. He was so loving and wonderful like that. There are so many qualities that he had that just shone out. As you mentioned, he wasn't the most talkative person in the room, but he was a man of great intelligence and great wisdom. And just with a few words, a few words of encouragement, he would tell us about how he was thinking about others, how he was worrying about others, how he was caring for others. He loved his children, Jack, Larry, and Lila, fiercely, and their extended families, and the children and the grandchildren. This was his t- source of tremendous nachas and pride. He just could never say enough good things. And I would say that the love that you showed back to him was very clear and evident. That there was rarely a day or two that went by that the kids were not with him. And certainly in the last few months, which were so difficult for him and for the family, multiple times of the day, morning and evening, to be with him, to see there, to hold his hand, not to just let maybe one of the caregivers or one of the helpers do it. That was not okay. The tremendous kibbutz ava aim, or the kibbutz aim in av in this situation that you showed for your father was really awe-inspiring and humbling. But it's no surprise with knowing who Harold was that you would show him that same love back that he showed to you. And at Park Plaza, where he lived for the last number of years, he was a tremendously beloved figure. He and Sharon and all of his friends would come together, and they were a tremendous person. You know, you might think that somebody who grew up in the war years and pre-war Europe, you know, would be kind of one of these old men and just kind of like time had passed him by, but time had not passed Harold by. He was as dashing and dapper as anybody could have expected. He, as someone said, had more suits in his closet than anybody else. He was stylish. He was dressed well. He appreciated the finer things in life and those things that he was denied as a young child. And he used those things to make himself a more full person and to continue to touch others. He would often speak about some of his wonderful childhood memories in Czechoslovakia and Torn, growing up in this wonderful, amazing family that was not in the city but outside, more in the country, and the Yiddish guy, the Judaism that he imbibed there, how he would remember them baking matzahs in their own matzah oven outside the house. He would remember all the different things they would do to make sure everything was kosher and to keep the family going. And he lived with those ideals of wanting to keep that life going. There are rare individuals in life that are, that are merit to see different types of worlds. The Gemara discusses somebody who would see a world that was alive and vibrant, and then to see that world destroyed, 
and then again to see the world alive and vibrant and reborn. Harold Tzvi was one of those people. He saw the world that was vibrant. He had this childhood, and then everything came crashing down. He saw the world destroyed, but he was a part of seeing the world rebuilt, of seeing the world thriving, the Jewish world thriving, his family thriving, his community thriving, as we mentioned, to help build up and build, literally building different homes. It's for us who were not part of that generation, very difficult to fathom how somebody raises themselves up from the ashes of the Holocaust, takes that fire that's been snuffed out and relights the fire and brings a, bur a burning fire in a greater way. He was a Kohen and he was proud of being a Kohen. When he would have the chance in Shul on Yom Tov to Duchen, it was a tremendous source of pride. I know he was able to do uh, a type of a duchening almost when the Torah came to him uh, this last week. You know, the Mishnah tells us that there are different crowns in a person's life. And there are different crowns we can merit to come. There's the crown of the kahuna that she had, the, the Kohen. There's the crown of the Malchus. There's the crown of kingship. There's the crown of Torah. But the Mishnah says that the Keser Shem Tov, the crown of a good name, is on top of all of those different facets. And here was a person who, yes, he had the crown of the priesthood of the kahuna, but the crown of a good name, of Harold Katz, of those who knew him, have so many blessings to say about this wonderful person who was so loving and so caring, such a, such a rock, that that crown, that Keser Shem Tov, is on top of all of those things. He taught me much, and he taught many of us so much. I'll just end with the words of the Perki Yavos, the Mishnah says, what is a good way to live a person's life? And the rabbis have different opinions. The first rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, says, you should have an eye in tov, a good eye, see things in a good light. Harold certainly saw things in a beautiful, good light. The next rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua, says, you should be a chaver tov, you should be a good friend. And he was also that, he was a good friend, and so devoted, and so generous, so loving. Rabbi Yossi says, you should be a shachin tov, a good neighbor. All the people at Park Plaza couldn't say enough good things about him. He was a good neighbor. He was good in his community. Another, Rabbi Shimon says, you should be roa es anolad. You should have a vision of seeing what's coming in the future. Harold saw what was coming, what was needed. He would see a need and he would fulfill it. He saw what was coming, the roa es anolad. And finally, Rabbi Lazar says, you should have a lev tov, a good heart. And the Mishnah ends that if you have a lev tov, you have everything else. And our dear Harold Katz, he had a lev tov. He had a good heart. He had a tremendous heart. He raised a beautiful family of children, grandchildren, and grand great-grandchildren. He only left a tremendous legacy, which will be so hard to fill. We are mourning with him, and as the rabbi said, we are going with him on this journey as his neshama is eternal. May his name continue to be for us a blessing. Yehi zichro baruch. I learned many things from my grandfather, watching him and being with him over the past 35 years. The ones that immediately come to mind when I think of him are working hard, taking personal responsibility, embracing challenges, being humble, and most of all, loving loyally. He could never do enough for his loved ones or his community. Truly selfless, to echo what Ethan said, he was constantly giving. He could not give enough. That said, I know that the words here today could never do justice to the type of man he was or how we all feel about him. He was a cut above the rest. One of the greatest from the greatest generation. His loss is truly immeasurable. However, I am comforted knowing his presence his values and his impact will only continue to grow through my mom, through Jack, through Larry, and anyone who is fortunate to have met him in their life. I could speak about my memories of him and my Grammy, my Judy baby, forever. And I know I don't just speak for myself when I say I'm forever grateful for the time I got with them and the opportunities that they gave me. 
I promise to continue striving to be like them for myself and for my children, including the newest addition, my son, born just four days ago, who we know Zaidi waited for him to know he was here and healthy before he left us. They are forever connected, and he will have the honor of having his Hebrew name be Tzvi to continue Zaidi's name and legacy into the next generation. We love you, Zaidi. One of my earliest memories of Harold by Zaidi is from the early 90s. I was four and sitting on his lap as he drove a cat bulldozer moving stones. He put his hands over the he put my hands over the controls and made me feel as if I was driving. I think of this memory fondly as while it was an adventurous one, I also remember feeling safe. Zaidi was a teacher to me. He taught me how to play chess, a game of strategy, a game of patience, a game we enjoyed playing together often, and one that I think he'd be proud of me, that the grasshopper learned to outdo the master. In my recent visits with Zaidi, we'd sit and play chess, and while we didn't speak much, I know that we both loved and cherished these moments dearly. My Zaidi instilled in me a hard work ethic. He taught me that hard work pays off in terms of providing for family and loved ones. Family, I could confidently say, was the most important to Zaidi. Zaidi is honored through his three children, his eight grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren. He got to know, see, and love his children as grandparents, his, grandchil his grandchildren as parents, and get to know the next generation of his family. That is amazing, and our family is so blessed to have that. I know that these memories and values that I've shared with Zaidi are not unique. Zaidi was known for so many of these values, a hard worker, a teacher, a member of the community, and in every moment you could see he was happiest, surrounded by his family. He is and will be dearly missed as Zaidi lives on in his wonderful family. And for that, I'm grateful. We compared our eulogies last night, and we both started with the same exact memory. So I had to come up with a different one. And there was no shortage of good memories to share. One of my favorite home movies is the 1988 rendition of This is an Old House as narrated by my father. He takes us through my childhood home, which was under construction, out to the back where Zaidi and his crew are laying the blonde brick that covers the back of my house. It's a hot day and Zaidi is working hard to make sure everything is just so. The pride in a job well done shines through their conversation, as well as my dad's admiration and love for his father. It is a funny, heartfelt, candid moment that I truly adore. The juxtaposition between this generous, hardworking man who could lay brick and stone and then gently entertain a grandchild is a beautiful thing. Those bricks still stand today. When I think about the type of Jew I am, the terms that come to mind are adaptable and tikkun olam. I have worked in the Jewish community in several capacities for the past six years, and the heritage I inherited from my grandparents is something that I've carried to work with me every single day. In fact, the invitation to Zaidi's Torah dedication ceremony is something that always hangs in my office, wherever I can see it when I need a bit of inspiration. Pictures of my grandparents and I have adorned every bulletin board in every workspace I've had since 2016. My grandparents had to adapt to many different difficult and unforeseen circumstances throughout their lives, from the Shoah to arriving to a new country and learning how to navigate a new culture and new languages, all at very young ages. What has stayed constant is that legacy of generosity and menschlichkeit. Zaidi was a mensch. You will hear that from everyone today. 
This quiet, unassuming, and gentle man lived a life filled with Torah, good deeds, and good people. Zaidi's penchant for tikkun olam, the concept of repairing the world, that's something that I have taken to heart. His homes in Morton Grove and at Park Plaza were adorned with certificates of appreciation and notices of merit from myriad Jewish organizations dating back to the 1960s. By working in the Jewish community and by founding a nonprofit animal rescue, I show him kavod, respect, every single day, while I too strive to make the world a better place. I've always believed that if my grandfather is proud of me, I must be doing things right. Saidi, I'm going to continue to make you proud by tenaciously adapting to both challenges unexpected and anticipated, and by doing what I can to repair the world the best ways I know how. Thank you for leaving us all such a beautiful legacy. We will treasure the memories of you and Dudley every day for the rest of our lives. How do we truly measure a person's life? How can we ever even begin to verbalize what worth of a person is? Indeed, our words can only attempt to bring to light the nechama, the soul, the spirit which is within the experiences and actions of a lifetime which have now left the body, which is no longer connected to a life. A child from a small town in Czechoslovakia brought up in an Orthodox Jewish home. His education was steeped in learning of the Torah, our religion, our prayers, a secular education was secondary. A 13-year-old boy who, along with his older brother, prevailed through the darkest period of mankind, where millions upon millions of innocent individuals were murdered. An adolescent Holocaust survivor who was discovered alive by aunts and uncles from Chicago and is able to emigrate to America and start a new life. A young man who learns English, works hard, finds life in America, and marries. A father who, despite the equivalent of a sixth grade education, works hard to give his family all that he never had as a child. All that was denied to him, his brothers, his sisters, his parents, all of which remained until the end of his days, a constant question in the back of his mind. Why couldn't I have done more to save my parents, my brothers, my sisters? Why couldn't I be there for them? Why couldn't I be there to help the other Jewish families to survive? Questions which were in his dreams. Questions which were a part of his sadness. But yet he persevered. He and mom saw their children grow up and marry. He and mom experienced what being a grandparent to eight is. I always reveled in the fact that my brother, sister, and I were able to give our parents the joy and blessing of seeing our families blossom. 
of our children giving them the love, respect, and admiration they so greatly deserved. Having our children know what it's like to have grandparents, which Larry, Lyle, and I never had. A right that was stolen from us. Dad was a quiet, gentle, and loving man. He didn't talk much. I guess he just didn't see the need to. Most likely because when mom was with us, she sure made it a point of letting her mind be known. Whether you wanted it or not, whether you liked it or not. Dad was a very literal man. When he did talk, he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. I don't know. Maybe it's because he was a mason contractor. You either had bricks or cement. It was one or the other. That's it. End of story. Although a quiet man, boy, could he pray. I always sat with him in synagogue as far back as I can remember. I was amazed at how beautifully he prayed. And that was my place. That's where I belonged, beside him, because I loved him, because I respected him. Larry, Lila, and I respected him for all he did for us, for all the sacrifices he made for all he and mom went through and did for us. Yes, that was my place at his side. Did he have anything more formal than a sixth grade education? No, but yet this man could speak and understand at least six other languages in addition to English, Yiddish, Hebrew, Czech, Hungarian, Polish, and Russian. Over the years, and more so since mom's passing seven years ago, dad went back to his roots. He returned to the life that was in his memory as a child. He returned to the synagogue. He prayed. He even decided to take back what the evil darkness had taken from him in 1941 at age 13. And so at age 88, he had his bar mitzvah. Although in the religious context, a bar mitzvah represents the transition from boyhood to manhood with the requisite expectations in Judaism, he had long ago made that transition he would observe the Sabbath. He would go to the daily services at the senior living center he resided in, and he was charitable. He was a mensch. Nothing made dad smile more than when he was with his grandchildren, and over the more recent years, his great-grandchildren. As of last Thursday, the birth with the birth of Elliot, the count is now up to nine. And I'm sure the count will continue to climb. Oh, how he loved them. So can these words we say today, can the words that we think in our mind and feel in our hearts but do not say, can they even come close to exemplifying the Nechama of our Father, the soul, the spirit of this amazing man. Maybe not. But instead, I believe the measure, the worth, the soul, the spirit, the Nechama of our Father and of our mother is right here in front of him. His children and their spouses, grandchildren, their spouses, 
and soon-to-be spouse, and the shining light of the great-grandchildren. That is what the measure and worth of Dad's life was and will forever be. Thank you, Dad. You did good. You did real good. ironic that for someone who spoke very little during his lifetime, we are saying so much and speaking so much. But you gave us no choice. We refer to a concept of Bashert, and the Baal Shem Tov would always speak about how nothing is by chance. You passed away on the Parsha of Kedoshim, and we enter now the Parsha of Emor. There are three portions in the Torah in the book of Leviticus, which are a string, one into the other. The Parsha, the portion of Acharemos, which means after the passing. The portion of Kedoshim, holiness, Holy ones, Emor, speak. There's a familiar adage that the three words together, Achremot Kedoshim Emor, which is usually understood that after someone's passing, speak about their holiness, speak about their goodness. But I'd like to put the comma in a different place. Here, acharemot kedoshim, after the passing of holy ones, emor, we must speak. We cannot be silent. Because in the world of Reb Tzvi, in the world of Harold, he literally lived that his actions spoke volumes. Actions spoke louder than words. But now we must speak about those actions. The living shall take to heart the purpose of all that we're talking about and all that you've heard from across, from, from Israel, to here, from the grandchildren, the children. He touched countless lives. He was so proud of his children deeply proud, fiercely proud, every single one of you. Jack, Larry, Lila, your spouses, your children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and then by extension, his adopted children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. There was no shortage of that, of how many he adopted. While the Nazis, Yimach Shemom, stole his childhood, robbed him of his parents, mother, father, three brothers, four sisters. They can never rob his neshama. They can never rob his soul. Fortunate to meet Judy, his lifelong spouse and partner in life, married for over 65 years. A loving relationship. Another Holocaust survivor. Together they built a world. They built worlds. We had the good fortune that he moved here to Chicago. 
There's another concept associated with the Parsha. It says, Emor al b'nei Aharon, speak to the children. This week's portion is about the Kohanim, the Kohen. Speak to the Kohanim, speak to the Kohanes, the children of Aaron, and say to them. The commentators ask, why the double usage of speak to them? Or even more so, when it says, speak to the Kohen, the Kohanim, the Kohanes, the children of Aaron. Isn't that obvious? If they're Kohanes, they're children of Aaron. One way of understanding that is, remember, the statement we must make, and when the statement we must take away today is remember, tell the Kohanim, you are the children of Aaron. That's a statement unto itself. All of us here today, we must remember who we had in our midst. The children of Aaron, who we have, and who we now have the responsibility of bringing along. We all heard from everyone here how much he cared, he loved. And I'd just like to share two anecdotes here. After building our shul, we had many who participated, involved, created opportunities of everyone who wanted to participate in some, in some way, even a small way, can participate. So we had, we had what was referred to as a dedication of a stone. Just dedicate a stone. A nominal amount, you could even pay it off, $1,000. It was one day after a kid, she came over to me and he said, Rabbi, I'd like to dedicate a stone. So I thought to myself, how beautiful. He wants to dedicate a stone. That is so special. So I asked him, who would you like to dedicate a stone in memory of, in honor of? He said, no, no, Rabbi. All the stones. All the Jerusalem stones. I want to dedicate it all. I wanted to make sure he understood. Do you know what that means? He says, I know, Rabbi. And he dedicated proudly all the Jerusalem stone. He not only dedicated it, but he wanted to make sure it was done right. He came back to it. He was proud of this and proud of that, but this needs a little touching up. He cared for it. That following year, there was a celebration of the family for his 88th birthday. And then he recalled, we were talking about it, 75 years since his bar mitzvah. 75 years. He then said, I'm going to have a bar mitzvah. He said, okay, we're going to have a bar mitzvah. We're going to call you up to the Torah. No, no, he did it in his way. He's going to dedicate a Torah, commission a new Torah. It was action, and boy was he proud of it. But although he was a person of few words, those actions were picked up by everyone. When we had that dedication of the Torah that he proudly had, and which was considered a true victory, triumph over what they tried to do to him. Am Yisrael Chai. The neshama lives. You can never take that away. He was fiercely proud of it. The media picked up on it. Immediately picked up on it. Newspapers all over. It made the front page of the Chicago Tribune. But then the Associated Press picked up on it. And newspapers all over the country had that story. I received emails from people across the country wanting to get in touch with Harold Katz, the bar mitzvah boy, the 89-year-old bar mitzvah boy, and share the message of how much this inspired them. 
it's never too late. Because he was that bar mitzvah boy. That youthfulness of being able to accomplish, to do more, and never be satisfied with past accomplishments, continued on in life. Dr. Viktor Frankl says, we should always ask ourselves, is our purpose to live, or are we living with purpose? After Harold's life experiences, it would be excusable for him to choose to live. 100% excusable. But that's not how he lived. All his life was about living with purpose. Not what I need, but what am I needed for? He cared for other people's needs. His entire being was about a higher purpose. Acharimot Kedoshim and more. We must speak about this. And as Rabbi Ethan mentioned, the last moments, having the opportunity of bringing the Torah to him, his Torah, who he cared and loved so much. We didn't want to scare him. We brought the Torah and told him that it's been quite a few weeks since you came to shul and we're able to get an aliyah and we call to your Torah, so the Torah is coming to you. And God willing, you'll get the strength back, you'll come back to the Torah. But deep inside he realized. He touched the Torah. He didn't just touch the Torah. He was caressing the Torah like he was saying goodbye to someone he loved. Caressing it. And then, as we're davening together, singing together, even duchening together, with my son-in-law, Rabbi Moshe. He then lifted up his hand. He was in control. There was a Zoom call with a family, and he left, and he said, I love you all. For those who were on the Zoom, those who were not on the Zoom, know that he meant each and every single one of you. I love you all. He asked for forgiveness if he did anything wrong. Thank you for giving me life. You should all live together. You should all live a life in the Jewish way. This is what gave him life. This is Harold's legacy. He may have had a sixth grade level of secular education, but he came with thousands of years, permeated with soul, with neshama. He had the good fortune of seeing his great grandchild that was born just a few days before he passed away. And ironically, just a few days before his own 94th birthday. However, Harold was organized. He may have passed away a few days before his 94th birthday, but life was never about him. Life was about taking what he, or more importantly, what his ancestors stood for, bringing it further. 
It's therefore not by coincidence that Shiva ends on his birthday. The day that the family gets up and resumes connecting with the world, taking his legacy back to the world, is on his birthday. Even his passing was not about him. And so as we continue on, let us take King Solomon's words to heart. Let Harold's precious, holy, sacred neshama continue to live on. Continue to live on as they will, no question about it. And Jack and Bonnie, and Larry and Janet, and Lila and David, his beloved grandchildren, and Jessica, and Aaron, soon to be his bride, Maxiandra, and Justin, and Russell, and Rachel, and Ethan, and Shana, and Adam, and Taryn, and Danielle, and Alex, and then Yoni. His precious great-grandchildren in Rosie Judith, Yonalev, Shalvi, Hadassah, Avigail, Yehuda, Vivian, Penelope, and Elliot. And many nieces and nephews, and so many countless who are touched by his life in every single one of us here today. Let us firmly resolve to take a mitzvah and make them a part of our lives. Let the soul of Tzvi ben Yaakov HaKoyin and Leah be bound in the bond of life and the bond of the living. I'd like to now call upon my associate rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Teldin, to please lead us in Kel Malir Achamim. El Mole Rahami Shoichain Miroimi Am Zemenuch and Echoinal Kanfe Hashino Bima Alois Kedoishimoto. Kizoi har horo ki ha maz hirim. Es nishmas tzvi ben yakev ha koyin shalach le oilam oy. Ba'avur shanachnur misvalim vad haskoras nishmas oy. Begane dente menu chasoi. Lachain balharach amim yastire ho vese serknof of le oilomim. Vitzroer, bitzroer ha chaim es nishmosoi. Adinoi unachalosoi vionuach bishaloim al mishkovoi vinoi mar amen. O God full of compassion who dwells on high, Grant proper repose on the sheltering wings of your presence in the lofty levels of the holy and pure who shine as the brightness of the firmament unto the soul of Svi ben Yaakov Akoyin, who has gone to his world and whose memory we pray and give charity. May his repose be in paradise. May the master of compassion bring him under the cover of God's wings and bind his soul in the bond of life. May the Lord be his heritage, 
And may he repose on his resting place in peace. And let us respond. Amen. Friends, this concludes the services here at the chapel. The interment and burial services will continue at Shalom Memorial Park in Arlington Heights. For those of you traveling with us to the cemetery in the funeral procession, please do keep the following safety precautions in mind. Please make sure your bright headlights and your four-way hazard flashes are on at all times. Please be sure to obtain an orange funeral safety sticker for your windshield, and we will be providing several of the cars throughout the procession with the magnetic orange flag to be placed on top of your car. Please travel as close as safety permits to the car in front of you to avoid any gaps in our procession. For your own safety and security, I would suggest not speaking or texting while driving to the cemetery in the funeral procession. As we make our way through the intersections, if the car in front of you goes through the intersection, even if the traffic signal changes, please do proceed with extreme caution. Feel free to use your horn liberally as you make your way through the intersection and please do everything that you can to proceed with caution and continue on with the procession. The family will be sitting Shiva at Janet and Larry Katz's residence at, uh, on Avers. The information about the specific times as well as the, the individuals who are helping service Shiva coordinators is all in the service folder that you should have received when you came into the chapel today. And if you do not receive it, uh, it is available as you leave. For those of you joining us online, that information is also available on the service folder. The family has also requested that any memorial contributions to Harold's memory to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. And again, that information is available on the service folder. At this time, I would ask everyone to please rise and stand in place as we ask those of you who have been selected by the family to serve as pallbearers to please come forward to my right as we escort the family, the casket, and the rabbi from the chapel. Thank you, and you may return to your